All right, welcome to uh, the second, I think this is the second Century Club meeting of the year. Uh, my name is Dr. Chris Burke, uh, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, utilizing video uh, resources, tools, and tips. I've used a lot of video in my instruction in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering over the last eight years. Uh, and as part of that, of course, we're live streaming this uh, via YouTube. And I'll talk, that's one aspect of this that I'll talk about here in a moment. Um, uh, so, uh, first of all, my bona fides. Uh, again, I've, I've been here for eight years, since about 2011. Uh, as an associate professor of practice now, of course, I started as a lecturer, became uh, assistant, now associate. Uh, I've been using video for over five years. In, in professionally, uh, in my professional situation, I've been using it for five years. Of course, I've done video longer than that. Uh, I've got a YouTube channel here, uh, and that's what we're live streaming over right now. Uh, I've, I've got 250 videos uh, about in my collection. Uh, there have, I've got over 400 subscribers, which is really cool because actually when you hit 100 subscribers, you can actually get a custom URL, which that's what it is. By default, if you have a YouTube channel, you just have this random URL with a bunch of uh, random letters. But once you hit enough popularity, 100 subscribers is nothing, by the, uh, uh, by the way, with uh, respect to professional YouTubers out there. Uh, but once you hit 100 subscribers, you can get a custom URL so that it isn't just a bunch of garbage. Uh, I've got my top video is over 21,000 views, and I've never had 21,000 even in uh, 20 years. I would never have 21,000 students. Uh, but I, I put that stat up there to illustrate that uh, if you do video, uh, you will have an impact uh, beyond just your own courses. Uh, th this, uh, that video is actually on uh, GDB, which is a debugging tool, uh, and it just turns, I, I had never expected it to be that popular. I just uh, put it out there for one class, and, it, uh, and apparently it's better than what was out there, or there was nothing out there like it. So, you know, uh, the 21,000 people have been using this across the world now. So uh, first of all, I'm going to explain why I use video, uh, and there are a couple of reasons. It feeds into my teaching philosophy, mainly, uh, that I like to cast a wide net. Uh, so of course, you, uh, it's not a replacement for the traditional lecture. Uh, it's not a uh, replacement for a course text or anything like that. I see it as a third part in this Venn diagram up here. Uh, that you know, uh, if, uh, if if you've got the people that use the textbook that do the required reading, people that uh, you know uh, actually go to lecture, uh, or one or the other, then they fall somewhere in this Venn diagram. And by adding one more resource out there, a video, uh, you're capturing people that may not have been in one of those two uh, groups before. Uh, and, and of course, you know, uh, kids today or whatever you want to say, whatever cliche you want to come up with. They do, prefer, they do seem to prefer video. I don't think that that's universal, but there are definitely people that prefer to see a video or prefer to have it there. Uh, another reason is, you know, we've got this uh, the old school notion of visual, oral, and kinesthetic learners. Uh, it's mostly been uh, academically debunked uh, that, uh, that there are, there's not somebody with an, uh, that, that's innately a visual learner or innately a kinesthetic learner, but the research that debunked it also gave evidence to show that people have a personal preference, uh, and that's where it comes from. Uh, and so it's, it's, it, from, from that perspective, it's still good to provide options. It's still good to provide video for those who prefer the video uh, and still have the other, uh, other aspects, you know, uh, I include lab, recitations, active learning, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I would put that on the Venn diagram too to capture a, you know, a cast a wide net. Uh, and I also look at learning as an exercise. Uh, and so if you, if you want to get into exercise, you know, you might ask yourself, what's the best exercise that you can do? Should I go bicycling? Should I run? Should I lift weights, right? Uh, and the answer to all those questions is none of them. The best exercise is the, the one that you actually do. So if you look uh, at the, what, what's the most effective teaching tool that I've listed so far, it doesn't matter. It's the one that the student actually engages in. And so if you are casting this wide net and you are capturing more than you would before, then I think that there's a case to be made for using the video, right? using videos of some sort, okay? Uh, I primarily engage in two, or produce two types of videos. Uh, one of them is the prepared video and the other one is the lecture capture video. Uh, the prepared videos are, are designed so that students 
uh, watch them before or after a lecture. Uh, they're, they're, kind of, uh, they're kind of in parallel with the lecture rather than you know, as, as part of it. Uh, generally, you have high production values out of these things because you can, uh, you can edit them as much as you want. You can go and reshoot them. Uh, if you screwed up, you can uh, pre-write a script if you want to and then read off that script. Uh, you can basically have very, very uh, high level and very fine-grained control over everything in a pre-prepared video. Uh, you can uh, you, you screw up, fine, you can edit that part out. Uh, you, can, you can take one piece and put it at the front if it makes sense. Uh, there, there's a much tighter production. Uh, it's much more highly polished. Uh, and you, can, uh, you have the option of editing it to perfection. You put as much time as you want into those videos. Uh, and, 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 and you can get the best looking video out of it. Lecture videos are a little bit different because it's the actual live recording of lecture. You can edit these uh, if you want to, but uh, if you're going to take the time to edit them anyway, you might as well do a pre-produced pre video. Um, it's uh, far less polished, but it's also less work. And I'll talk about several of the uh, several options for doing this. And you can see over there the camera. Uh, that's a vid grid system, and that's one of the options available here at UNL. That's not, I'm not using that right now, though. I'm using OBS software, which is something else I'll talk about. Uh, so the good is that it's perfect for online sections. Though, though I've used videos for over five years, I've never actually taught an online section. Uh, it's all been as part of a regular old section. And eventually, I'm sure that there will be a demand. And I'm, uh, some of my classes are polished enough to a point where we could just flip a switch and make it online if we, if we need be. Uh, at, this point, at this time, the, the, the demand is just not there, though. But they're perfect for online sections. Uh, or a parallel online section if you're using something like a VidGrid system and capturing all your lectures. Uh, then you don't have to do much extra work just to get a, an entire online section. Uh, also, another, another good aspect of this is that students get a second chance. Uh, that uh, if they skipped lecture or missed it for whatever reason, or they just weren't taking good notes, uh, or they just want to see what you did again if you're tutorializing it and you, you went through a process or something, then they have a second chance because it's recorded. Uh, you don't have to give that lecture again. In fact, uh, for a lot of questions that I get online, we, I use an online forum uh, system called Piazza where students can post questions. Uh, if the question is answered, you know, if traditionally if the uh, question is answered by the handout or something, I will just simply say from the handout and then cut and paste the quote that giving them the hint, maybe you should be reading, right? Uh, that here's, the, here's the answer to that. With video, you can do the same thing. Uh, but uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll take the lecture, I'll fast forward to the point where I cover that, and I'll post the video as a response instead, a, a time sequence to that time so that all they have to do is hit play and there's my answer. Uh, it, it completely reduces the work that you need to do to, to answer these uh, answer questions like that. We cover that, in, uh, and it also it gives you a kind of a passive aggressive way of telling them maybe you should have come to lecture, maybe you should have taken better notes. Well, if you didn't, here's your second chance. Right? Uh, you can watch and rewatch at your own pace. Uh, this is especially good for English as a second language students, uh, and especially good if you've got a system that auto captions them. Uh, and you know, a YouTube auto captioning is not great, but it's free. You get what you pay for, uh, and it, uh, it it really does help ESL students um, if if they don't get everything that uh, that that you say right away. Especially if you're a fast talker, uh, or if, if you're not a, if, if you're not good at cadence or whatever, right? Uh, then uh, they can uh, they can back it up. See, I, I missed that part. They can slow it down. They can speed it up. They have a lot of options. It actually does not, one, one myth or one concern that I've heard from people about using video is, well then what's the lecture section becomes superfluous. We don't need to hold it anymore because nobody will come. And that's actually quite the opposite in my experience. In fact, uh, in my CS2 course, Computer Science 2 course last semester, uh, we were using the VidGrid system and I had pre-prepared videos. I had everything available. And uh, student, re student self-reported now, so take it with a grain of salt, but 83% had claimed that they had not missed more than two classes uh, by the midterm evaluations. Uh, so at least students uh, feel like they still have value in coming to lecture and they'll still come to lecture even if you've got videos online for it. Uh, so uh, it's a better overall experience because of all of these options. Uh, and, and again, it's not a replacement for lecture. It's an, aug it's an augmentation to lecture. Uh, you're, you're, uh, you're giving them more options uh, for reviewing the material. Uh, there's more learning opportunities, uh, and uh, again, like I said, my top video has over 21,000 views, 
and that's not, and there, are, there aren't that many students here at UNL in computer science. Uh, it was just a niche topic, and apparently it wasn't covered well with other videos out there. And so I had a much wider impact uh, uh, outside of this. You know, we, uh, academics are always talking about broader impacts. Well, there is a broader impact to teaching, right? You put up a video, and you can reach 21,000 students across the, across the world, right? Uh, and uh, so uh, those are the good aspects of, uh, of video. The bad aspects, of course, there's always a trade-off here. Uh, there's potentially a huge investment in your time. Um, it is not unheard of to think that if you want a 10-minute video, you're going to spend two hours producing that video. Right? Uh, if, if, I would even say, you know, uh, shoot high, uh, uh, a multiplicative factor of 20. So for every one minute of polished video that you get out the uh, get in the can and out there, uh, you probably spent 20 minutes of prep time, of uh, editing, uh, of captioning if you choose to do so, uh, all all that uh, all that stuff that uh, that's necessary to produce one of those pre-prepared lecture videos. Um, and also, videos still have a shelf life. Um, you can't. You, you might think, well, okay. This is a huge investment, but it's okay because I'm going to make this video and it's going to last me for 20 years. And probably not, right? Uh, maybe uh, videos maybe have a shelf life of four or five years. Uh, then they kind of get stale because styles change. Uh, uh, maybe it wasn't as polished to begin with. Uh, maybe the audio wasn't all that great. And you, you've got a better setup now uh, and you want to reshoot it. Or, uh, you know what, I, I have a different perspective on that topic now and I'd like to update it uh, for that new perspective. And so videos do have a shelf life. It's not something that is going to last you for the next 10 years or something. Whatever that is, you know, yeah, you have to judge that for yourself. And captioning is terrible. Uh, there are some online systems that allow you to, uh, to type. Basically, a captioner is sitting there uh, and transcribing everything. And then they have to go back and they have to time sequence it. And uh, the Americans for Dis Disability Act does have uh, stipulate a... Uh, you know, 72 character maximum, and uh, 72 characters has to appear for a minimum amount of seconds, even if it doesn't match up with the video. Uh, and so you've got all of uh, all of these guidelines that are put out by the ADA, uh, and uh, and you need to meet those guidelines. You know, technically, as a public institution, we have to be delivering those captions. Uh, some of my original videos, I said, well, all right, well, it's, it's got to be done. It's got to be done. And you spend, start spending you know, three times as much time to caption the video, to time sequence them, and then to include that in the end. Uh, so there are websites that help you with this. Uh, Google has automated captioning, you know, voice recognition, and it tries to do its best. That's, that might be a good start, a starting point, because you know, it, it's not perfect. You can go in and edit it, uh, but it can cut down on the time. Now, with the vid, something like the VidGrid system, UNL does pay for... Uh, for captioning services, and it, it, it's not coming out of your pocket directly, uh, but there is a limit. Uh, so if you're if you're doing thousands upon thousands of hours of video, you might have to talk to them about a budget of some sort. But if you do it alone, it is one of the worst aspects of doing video. Uh, the ugly, <laughs> uh, just because I wanted the good and bad and the ugly, uh, is that you need good equipment. Uh, so for year for the first couple of years, I was I just had this crappy uh, headset with with a built-in microphone. The audio was always terrible, uh, and so you you do need a good webcam. This is just a fifty dollar webcam. It's okay. Uh, there are four K webcams out there. The built-in webcams are okay, uh, but you do need uh, some good equipment. Uh, you need a good mic setup. Uh, this is all together, the, including the arm and the uh, pop guard here. This was about $100, but you can tell the, the difference between the audio. And if you go back and watch this video or watch some of the videos, it makes a huge world of dis difference. And this is only a $100 uh, setup. You can, of course, go nuts and have $1,000 uh, audio equipment. You don't need it, uh, $100. The difference between a $20 microphone and a $100 microphone, that is huge. The difference between a $100 microphone and a $1,000 microphone, not so much. So it, it, it is a small investment. You can get your department to buy it. Uh, I wanted it any, uh, for myself anyway, and I wanted to expedite it, so I just paid for this one. You do have to pay for software, though, and I did get my department to pay for Camtasia, which is something I'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, but otherwise, a lot of the stuff is free. YouTube is free. Uh, Amara, the, uh, the captioning website that I mentioned, is free. Uh, and so you can do this on a pretty low budget. All right? 
Uh, one of the one of one thing that you can't control too well though is space. You need a quiet space. Uh, when I do this in my office, I tend to try to do it more during the summer or more during the uh, the off hours uh, because once you do have a good microphone set up, it picks up everything, uh, including people talking right outside your office, including uh, you know people opening and closing, slamming doors, uh, all that stuff, and. Uh, it's terrible. It's a huge interruption for those pre-produced videos. Uh, so you need a quiet time or a quiet space. One thing that I'll talk about later is uh, the One Button Studio. Uh, there are two of them on campus where you can go and you, uh, it, it's a it's a, uh, a separate room. Unfortunately, those rooms were not designed from the beginning for soundproofness. So uh, you still have the issues over there. In fact, they for whatever reason they decided to locate them in extremely busy areas. Uh, and uh, they're not, uh, and that's one drawback to, to using the one button studio. Uh, but you do need a quiet space. Uh, and if the university ever, you know, is designing a new building, hopefully with a new engineering building coming up, uh, I've, I've asked certain people to really consider, hey, you need a soundproof booth from the beginning for stuff like this if you want to, if you want to do it right. Uh, you might have to invest in pre-production. That right means writing scripts, uh, refining scripts, uh, sticking to the scripts. <laughs> You may mean that you want to go through and practice, if you practice traditional lectures or something like that. Uh, you might have to do multiple takes, uh, depending on what you're doing. And, of course, always test your equipment. I can't tell you how many hours I've wasted, this is particularly in the One Button Studio, how many hours I've wasted of, I, I did an hour lecture and then nothing, and find out nothing was recorded, or find out that the, uh, the, the audio was not recorded. The video was fine, but the audio really wasn't recorded. Or that uh, the light table, uh, the, the light board that I was using was not centered for, properly, so half of it was cut off. And then, what do you have to do? You have to go back to square one. You wasted that hour uh, of production time. Right. Uh, I use six different tools uh, for video production for different use cases: uh, Camtasia, uh, VidGrid, YouTube, One Button Studio, and the light board. Uh, OBS, which is oh, the real OBS, that's, that's open broadcast software. That's what I'm using right now to broadcast on YouTube. Uh, and finally, Zoom. You might be familiar with some of this stuff. Uh, so if, if you have any comments or you want to correct any misconceptions that I might have, uh, please go ahead and uh, uh, raise your hand and, uh, and, and, and speak. Uh, but uh, Camtasia, its primary use is for high quality video production, uh, non linear editing. You can uh, you can splice this part of the video and move it over here. You can you can cut, uh, you know, do a ripple cut. And uh, I, I had to uh, I, I paused for five seconds, and I don't want that five seconds in there. You can ripple cut that out. Uh, you can split the video and the audio, and then take the audio out and drop in different audio. Uh, you can do transitions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's for uh, you, you can use multi-source video, so it can capture your de desktop. It can capture as many webcams as you can plug in. Uh, it can capture audio, it can capture basically anything that you want. Um, it also has rudimentary visual and audio effects. And th there are some alternatives like Filmora, Capt uh, Captivate, ScreenFlow. They're, uh, they're a lot cheaper or free. Uh, Camtasia is not that expensive though, it's 100, 150 bucks and I got my department to foot the bill. So uh, that, that's, that, that's great for me. <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it just provides a lot of stuff. This is what it looks like. Uh, you have various video clips that you've recorded. You can record directly in Camtasia uh, with multiple video sources. Uh, this is one of my uh, uh, one of my videos for Computer Science One, uh, and you can see the nonlinear editing down here. Uh, this is the, uh, the the you know you, you drag it. Off. This is your ribbon down here. Of uh, let me zoom out. Uh, so you can see that I've made a lot of edits, uh, and that's because this is a, a pre-produced video. I had a lot of transitions. Uh, parts where I screwed up because I didn't write a script for this one, I just ad libbed and so I thought, well, this is what I need to say. Uh, I know I want to say it differently. I just kept recording because I knew that I would go back in and cut it down. Right? Uh, typically, I, if I record an hour, I know that I'm going to cut that down to about 10 minutes uh, because of all the, the, the cuts. And cutting it down is going to take me, for an hour of video, it's going to take me five hours of editing. Um, and you can also add, you have multiple uh, channels here. For example, over here, uh, I overlaid uh, I overlaid stuff. And th that's what this is, and I transitioned that in. So if you can take a look, it uh, it transitions. There we go. It, it, it just faded in. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with Camtasia. 
uh, basically any nonlinear editing tool, uh, editing capabilities that you can think of, uh, you can use with Camtasia. Uh, and again, uh, here, let me. So again, it's uh, you can go back and forth, fast forward, you know, edit it as much as you want. If you've got a section that I want to cut that, you can, you know, drag that over, cut it, do whatever you need to do with it. I will, of course, won't do this. But what does the uh, uh, once you once you've edited it, you can uh, upload it directly to YouTube, and it looks something like this, right? Uh, so that was cut down to 23 mi a 23 minute video. While we're waiting for that to load, one tip: keep your videos short. Uh, if, unless it's a lecture capture where you lectured for an hour, pre-prepared videos should be ideally five to ten minutes because, again, people like videos because they're easily digestible and you need to make it easily digestible for them. Uh, but here, uh, there we go. So this is me coding, uh, giving a live coding uh, demo exercise for Computer Science One. I can transition in other things. Here I'm compiling and showing the results of that program. Uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm transitioning other things in. I can transition back and forth from one screen to another. And so, high, highly polished video, basically, is the takeaway there. Uh, here's another example in which I, uh, I, I, not, uh, I did it str this streamer style. Uh, you probably are familiar with, you know, uh, I, I have no interest, I have very little interest in video gaming myself, uh, and I have zero interest in watching other people play video games, but apparently, that is the huge thing. It's, go, it's called streaming, right? People just play video games and they put their face down at the bottom right or the top right so that they can get a reaction or you know whatever. And I did this one streamer style where I'm talking and I just captured uh, from my webcam, I captured my face uh, looking back and forth. Um, one drawback to this is if you've got essential stuff that you need to show, then I go in and edit myself out. I just transition, fade that away for that particular part. And then I fade it back in it was just an experiment, uh, you know, I don't know if I'll continue to do it streamer style uh, but, uh, with, with, with your face down at the bottom, but uh, that's always an option. Oh, question? Okay. All right. Um, the second tool that I use is VidGrid. You might be familiar with this. I, I just, I didn't know whether or not there would be one in here, so I just took a, uh, a few snapshots of uh, the automated cameras that are in several, of, uh, several uh, general purpose classrooms across campus. This room is equipped with one. Uh, and basically, uh, it's, it's for live video capture of your lectures. Uh, you can go to uh, uh, this, this website right here, UNL Academic Video, and uh, they've got a form there that you fill out. And you say, I am teaching in this classroom, uh, well, one of these classrooms. They're, they're, they are expanded it out. I think that this list is, uh, is the original list. I think that they've uh, since expanded it out. I, I definitely know that. Uh, uh, no, uh, no maybe, maybe this is the current list. Uh, but if you're in a larger lecture hall, then they should be enabled. They, they'll have these things up there. You just say that I want my lectures captured. Uh, give them the class number, the section number, the time. If you want to attack on five minutes before, five minutes after, just, uh, just to be safe, uh, then you, you can also specify that. Uh, it has limited editing capability. You can kind of cut from the beginning and the end. Uh, but you can always download the video and then take it into Camtasia and do whatever editing you want. Uh, but that's not really the purpose of capturing live lecture. Capturing live lecture is so that you have the whole thing there. Right. Question? Oh, okay. Correct. It is also audio. It's also software. So you go to the website, you download something, and uh, you can still lecture capture your your desktop as well as uh, your your audio. You'd have to, of course, set up a microphone to do this. Uh, but in these uh, in these uh, rooms, it captures the live mic. So if you've got a mic and you mic it up and you can hear it in the hall, then it's capturing that audio. It's automatically capturing that back there, and it puts it side by side. Uh, so whatever is up on the screen is on the right, and then you, uh, the, the live video feed here is what's recorded. And it comes out kind of like this. This is a class that is more oriented for like a traditional math class where, where I would normally do this on a whiteboard, 
Uh, but since I wanted to use the vid grid system, I switched over to doing it on pen and paper with the overhead projector. Uh, and the overhead projector is the one that can capture it. It can't capture whiteboard. Capturing whiteboard is very, extremely difficult uh, because of glare, and they're just, they're, they're, they're just not recordable that well. Uh, and also, you know, if you're capturing a whiteboard, then you kind of need a cameraman at that point to be able to zoom in on what's important. Uh, but uh, this is, if you've got a computer, then the computer would uh, appear on the right instead. And I've got another example of that. That's what I do over in Henslick. Uh, it, it, it's capturing me uh, at the stage and then capturing what's on my screen on the left. I, I, I don't know what the setup is, left, right, or whatever. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that that's uh, something that they, uh, that, they that they take care of. Uh, pretty decent audio, but that's because I'm mic'd up uh, and it's a, uh, it, it, it is wireless. Uh, you do have to make sure that the batteries are charged each time. Otherwise, I have had lectures where it cut out and I didn't notice it uh, and half the video was ruined. Right? Um, I can only name one time that the VidGrid system failed me. Uh, and that was at the very beginning, piloting it. Since then, it has been 100%. There have been a couple of times where the video failed to actually process, and I had to contact a tech support, but they eventually came through. Um, let me go back a couple here and show you what it looks like. Uh, once, you, once it's been captured, now of course if you're capturing it with the software on your desktop, I think the video is right there on your computer. Uh, but if you uh, capture it uh, through the, uh, the automated system, then you just simply go to you know, app.vidgrid.com uh, and uh, you've got a, a, a UNL uh, uh, login right here. Uh, and I don't know why it's taking so long to load, but the videos will load up and you can, uh, come on. Hmm. Probably because I'm streaming, I'm using a lot of bandwidth right now. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the videos should come up uh, and then you can you can curate them, you can delete them if you if you need to. There we go, finally. Uh, and you can play them. You, you even have a view count here. So I share the uh, the link directly to the VidGrid system as well as duplicating those on YouTube. Uh, and uh, I can see how many people uh, have watched it through the link that I gave them. So 16 people watched my lecture from today using VidGrid. I can then see you know how many people watched it on YouTube. There's no guarantee those are my students, of course. In fact, they're probably not. Uh, but uh, I, I duplicate the effort. In fact, I was at um, uh, a uh, vendor show earlier this year, and VidGrid was there, and I said, hey, I use your system. He oh, tell us about it. What, is there something that you'd like? And I said, well, I'd really like a button where you could auto uh, not, I have to download the video and then upload it to YouTube. I'd really like a button like Camtasia where you hit a button and it shares it to YouTube directly. And he sat there and asked me, why would you want that? And I go, well... What if UNL stop, decides to stop paying you? <laughs> Where's all my videos now? Uh, and, uh, and, and so I, I, need, I need to download those and put those on YouTube because that has a much broader impact anyway. Uh, so he sat there, mm, okay, that's a good point. And so instead of giving them an idea to share it to YouTube, I think I gave them an idea to, uh, <laughs> to not be able to download it anymore. <laughs> uh, but that's the uh, VidGrid system right there. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, I don't know that we'll, uh, we, we now do have participants for some reason, uh, but uh, I'll repeat that what, you, what she said, that uh, if you have uh, an SSD student, uh, the SSD office could give you unlimited uh, captioning capability. Uh, normally that's limited. I don't know how many hours it's, I think it's limited like UNL wide. So if you caption everything, maybe that's just taking away the, the allocation from everybody else, I don't know. Uh, at some point though, UNL uh, will just have to pay more uh, for the captioning services. Yeah. All right, and again, that is one of the worst things. I'd never want to do it again, and I will never do it again. Uh, I will not caption until somebody complains. Then I'll come back to the SSD office and say, yeah, you need to do this. Uh, the third tool that I use is YouTube, like I'm using right now. Uh, it is by far, bar none, the best hosting system, period. 
UNL has a video hosting website. Uh, of course, we've got, you know, uh, Vid, the VidGrid can host videos. None of them hold a candle to YouTube. Uh, YouTube is able to, uh, you know, uh, serve billions of videos, billions of users, literally billions of users all around the world. You, nobody is going to ever hope to match them for services and, and redundancy and storage capability. Uh, always, also, it's free, right? Uh, why wouldn't you use something that is the, the, the best system but also free? Uh, it's nearly always available. Everybody knows what YouTube is. Uh, everybody, know, everybody has a YouTube account. Uh, and there's a high potential audience out there. Uh, this, this also provides a, a curated video solution. So if you don't want to make your own videos, go out and find somebody that already has, whatever your topic is. Uh, and then just watch the, make sure that it's a good video. Uh, and then, then put that as part of your collection, right? Uh, it, is, it is perfectly fine to link to anything that is publicly available without prior permission. Uh, oftentimes people will email me and say, can I use your video? I think, well, it's public. You don't need permission. Yes, go ahead and use it. Uh, and, and so there, it is a curated, you could have a bunch of curated videos that you never made. Or uh, I still do this even if I've made a video on a topic because I like to provide a, an alternative perspective uh, and an alternative way of doing things. Uh, maybe, maybe people didn't understand my explanation of it, but maybe also understand somebody else's explanation of it. Uh, again, I said it's free. That comes with a caveat, as long as you don't do any monetization. Uh, if you do monetization, that is you get paid for your content that you deliver on YouTube, uh, then they are able to run ads. If you opt out of monetization, then people that are viewing your videos will never see an ad. Right? Uh, ads are, are the thing that pays you to do it. Um, it, it it's not worth it. Uh, I looked into an estimate for monetization, and even the, that, that one video that I had 21,000 viewers, it would have given me $40. <laughs> so uh, it is definitely not worth it. But if you do get enough uh, subscribers, you can have a custom URL, just like me. Right? Uh, and I just chose Chris Burke UNL because all of my videos are UNL related. I do have personal videos on there, but I don't list them. They're not publicly available. I only share them with family. Like I'm not going to put my kids up on YouTube or anything. Uh, an another tool is the One Button Studio, and unfortunately it has a very unfortunate name because the acronym is OBS, and OBS is already an established acronym in video, one, uh, uh, Open Broadcast Software. Uh, but uh, at least in one of the rooms, they've renamed it to o uh, one, one Touch Studio, which I think is a better, better name because there's no uh, ambiguity there. Uh, but it's a do-it-yourself recording system with ideally a single push button. You push the button, it starts recording. You push the button, it stops recording. And everything is magically done for you. That's not the case. Uh, first of all, if you want to uh, reserve those rooms, you can do th so through, uh, there, there's more information here. Uh, let me go, go there. And this is a, this is a video, uh, no text or anything, showing you how it works. Well, it's an idealized version of how it works. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to walk in. There it is. Uh, oh. I, I've never been to that one. I don't know where that is. Uh, but the lighting is automated. Uh, you do have a, a video uh, that, that, show, uh, that shows you you. There is a little bit of a one second delay or so. Uh, the camera's already there and set up. You can see yourself. Uh, you hit the button. You, you want to stop. You hit the button. Uh, you put in uh, that, that memory stick and it loads, uh, processes the video and loads it automatically for you. And wow, that was easy. Not so easy. All right. <laughs> Uh, there's more information about it and its features. And I say that it's not so easy because there is a huge list of things that you have to do to make sure that it's get, you get it right. Uh, first of all, some pictures. It's, uh, the, the, the two one-button studios that I know of are over in Henslick 123F. Uh, well, they located it right there in Husker Tech, where a lot of people are talking, a lot of people are studying. And if you get it when it's empty, then great. But uh, does that look like a soundproof room to you? No. Uh, in fact, down at the bottom right here, there's a vent, which is the only air in and out. It's completely open, so you hear everything coming in. Um, there is the actual setup with the camera in the back. This is over in Henslick, uh, and it's a, it's a Mac setup. You, you just plug your USB device over uh, here somewhere. There is an, uh, a, a microphone that you, that you use, uh, and, but I love this thing. This is called a light board. So it's not a whiteboard. A whiteboard, you write on it, uh, and, uh, and, and you know it, 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 it's normal and everything. You can see it this way. 
It's a light board. It's a clear acrylic board. You use this special, uh, they're not special, they're just fluorescent because uh, there are lights on the side that make the fluorescent pop out and you can actually see it. Now I've got all the lights on right now, so that's not how you do it. Instead, you need to shut off all the lights so that it's not backlit. You're on a black surface uh, and everything pops out and you're writing on this. And now maybe I'll, you'll understand why I have this shirt on today. I use this shirt, because, why is it a backwards N? Right? Because if you're writing like this, your perspective, I'm writing backwards. So one thing that you have to do with this video is in post-production, you have to flip it. Well, the first time I did this, I had my polo on with an N, and throughout the entire thing, there, there was a backwards N here. I said, uh, uh, so uh, I, I went back and I said, all right, well, I need a backwards N shirt so that when I flip it around, it will be the correct way. Uh, and so I went back to my department and said, I want a backwards N shirt. And so, of course, they what? <laughs> so I explained to them what, the ha what I was doing. Um, they said, all right, well, look, we'll look into it. For one shirt to be pressed by our official uh, vendor, it was $80. So uh, I got this shirt by simply going down to a shirt pressing and said, give me an N that looks like the Nebraska N that doesn't have a copyright on it and print it backwards for me. And they did it for 20 bucks. Right? And so that's why I'm wearing this today, so you can see how, how this would actually work. Uh, here's the One Button Studio in love. We'll take a look at a couple of videos here in a second. It does not have that light board. If you want the light board, you have to go over to Henslick. Uh, but I, I don't have any exterior. This is the exterior. It's over in the Union, which is even busier. Uh, and those are not, <laughs> there's no such thing as, uh, as soundproof glass that I know of. Uh, and so it, it, it can be quite noisy. I've never actually used this directly, but it's got, but it, it, it does try to make it as user friendly as possible. It's got this one, do this, two, do this, three, do this, uh, all, these, uh, all these numbers here. You just have to press the button and it goes, right? Uh, there, there's the button, five, start the button, to stop it, press it again, hold it. Here's what it looks like with the, uh, the light table, or the light board, excuse me. Uh, this is one of the first ones I did, and of course you'll notice me wearing my polo uh, and uh, the backwards N. Uh, but you can see what it looks like. Um, it's no longer backlit, and the light from the sides is highlighting the, uh, the fluorescent uh, writing. Um, and so you can you, you talk, you can write as much as you want, erase it, rewrite, uh, and record. Uh, here's another example where I got my cooler t-shirt, and there it is, the correct end. Uh, right? Now, if I had this to do over again, of course, I, I think I'd get a darker red or maybe just wear black entirely. Uh, but it, it does, I mean, if you wore, if you, if you wore some white, uh, like a lot of white, then the, the, the text that's appearing over your, your white shirt would probably be washed out. Right? You also have to be very careful on the, uh, on the positioning of this thing and make sure that it, it, it's in frame. That's why when I showed this up here, You'll see that uh, I, I made a bunch of ticks on the side and did a test up front to see which tick was actually in scope. Because uh, and, and uh, again, like I said, I wasted several hours in the one button studio where it, it got cut off or screwed up uh, somehow. Uh, so uh, again, it, it's one button ideally, but there's lots of stuff to take care of. Uh, you have to have clear writing. I have terrible handwriting, so I tried to go sl as slow as possible uh, and, uh, and it still didn't work that great. Uh, you have to frame it correctly and make sure that it stays there. there it does lock uh, so that you don't move it around, but if you do hit it, then of course it'll jiggle, so you have to be careful about that. You have to keep your stuff short. Uh, I lectured in there for one full hour, and then I go, I go to process it, processing, 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 too large. Uh, so I wasted an hour. Uh, the next time I did it, I cut it, I cut it down. You should cut down video anyway. 10 minute increments. Okay, now I'm done, save it. Now, all right, next 10 minutes, done, save it. And I made sure that after each iteration of that, the video actually made it onto my USB stick. Uh, clothes are of course a concern. You don't wear bright, shiny stuff. Uh, there are a variety of colors. Uh, there's no pure white though. Uh, unfortunately, they are terrible to erase. Uh, that's why you see over here on the table, they, they have an eraser, the eraser does not work. You have to spray it down and wipe it down every single time. And wiping it down itself takes several minutes to get it all right. Uh, that's the time, what I've done, instead of cutting that out, 
I just speed it up like 10 times. And so you see me go like zzz, 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 zzz. And it's actually kind of a cool effect. But uh, that, that's why you've got the, 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 the uh, paper towels there. And then they've got a cleaner that you spray it. And uh, that, that it's necessary because that fluorescent stuff stays. And it does not come off without real scrubbing. Uh, another another aspect of it is sound. Again, uh, not, neither one of them was designed uh, with the idea of having a uh, a soundproof studio to begin with. Uh, again, maybe maybe if they build a, a building from uh, and, and design, because um, there I think that there uh, there are uh, you know uh, what are these what are these called the the pipes that go up, uh, the ventilation system is right above it. And so if, the, uh, if you can hear it right now, that ambient noise, that's going to be picked up on everything. Right? Um, yeah, and uh, the, the other aspect of it, too, is if, um, if you screw up and you want to back up and you want to say something again, well, it, it, it's like kind of like a jump cut, where if you, were, if you had your hand up like this the entire time, and, uh, okay, I need to take two. Well, you need to make sure that your hand was in relatively the same position. And even when you edit it down, it's going to jump like this a little bit. And it's going to be a little bit noticeable, but that's okay. Uh, a lot of streamers do it anyway. A lot of streamers will, uh, will you'll, very noticeable jump cuts, and they just go with it, and it's like an effect. Right? Uh, so there are, uh, there, there are a lot of issues with it. It's, it's not purely one button yet. <laughs> uh, also, it's a hot box. It's a very, very hot in there. Uh, you, you can see me in some of those videos wiping my brow and, and, and getting the fluorescent stuff all over me. Uh, the, the fickle sound, not great locations. Keep them short, otherwise the system cannot handle long videos. Uh, but it is very cool when it works. Right? The real OBS is open broadcast software. This is a free piece of software where you can basically do what Camtasia does. Uh, it, it, it's a full television studio. So if you think about a television studio and say, all right, go to camera one, now go to camera two, now to go to camera three, that's what I'm running on this, this screen right here. Uh, at the risk of making everything screw up because of infinite, uh, you know, infinite mirrors uh, kind of uh, effect, I'm going to bring it over here and show you what it looks like. Right? Uh, and that's what it looks like. I, I've got uh, a preview on the left, and then I can say, go to camera two and transition. And on the right, that's what I'm actually streaming right there. Uh, and now we're going to get an in, uh, now we're going to get an infinite. Uh, you can see it kind of going in there. Uh, hopefully, it doesn't slow it down. Uh, but you can have as many input devices as you want. You can have as many scenes as you want. I only have two scenes right here. I'll show you that I can transition to full screen uh, without this camera and my webcam and the title screen. Uh, I can transition back, right? And this uh, that that's going to be a preview. Uh, oops, I want side panel. There we go. Transition to that. There we go. And if you watch the video later on, you can see what it looks like. Uh, but otherwise, you, you can uh, stream automatically to YouTube. Uh, you can stream to, um, what's the game one? It's, uh, Twitch, right? You can uh, stream directly to Twitch, which is mostly for game. In fact, I asked my TAs when I started uh, streaming, should I, should I go to Twitch? And they said, no, no, don't do that. Uh, uh, Twitch, uh, if you want to do it seriously, then go to YouTube. Uh, you don't want Twitch. Twitch is just for gaming. Uh, and, uh, or, or life streaming or live streaming, whatever it is. But people just carry a camera around 24-7 and people watch them. It's like a real world uh, uh, Truman show, exactly. Weird, right? But different, uh, different strokes for people, for different folks, I guess. Um, it's, it's, it's intended for live uh, in-office streaming. Uh, I've done this before. Uh, for example, snow days. Uh, there was a snow day and we were going to miss a lecture. I've done this several times uh, when there have been snow, snow days over the years. Or when I was sick and I just, or when my kids were sick and I had to stay home. I just, I just live stream that day. Uh, you can see what it looks like here. I'm, I'm in my office uh, doing uh, what was called uh, Advent of Code. So. And then I've got my little Christmas tree there. Uh, I'll go ahead and mute it. Uh, each year, there's this uh, advent of it's an advent calendar with a programming challenge that is released every day. And of course, I teach computer science one programming. And uh, near their final exam period, uh, advent of code starts coming out. And so, as review, instead of reviewing directly in class, I think the first four days of the advent of code, I do a live stream of each one of those. Uh, I'm not the first one to do this, of course. 
uh, but I do a live stream of it as a, uh, uh, as a review for the students. Uh, not only that, but when you live stream to this, like I'm live streaming right now, it'll end up as a recorded video on YouTube uh, with, with, with no extra steps for, for you to do it. Uh, so uh, and you can, of course, delete it if you want. For example, I came here an hour early to make sure that the setup worked, so I live streamed about 10 seconds of this stuff. Uh, some smart aleck uh, commented, wow, amazing, uh, even though it was just me saying test, test, and that video will be deleted uh, after I'm done. But this video I can keep in perpetuity for as long as I want, and I can do whatever I want with it, right? And we can give it to the executive vice chancellor and say, yes, you should continue the uh, Century Club, right? Uh, let me stop, stop this video so we don't get the audio later on. And the last, uh, I, I have, uh, I've used this support, and a lot of you have used Zoom before, uh, I'm sure. Uh, but there are, I haven't used it as a video service, but there, I have heard of other instructors using it in their classrooms uh, to hold uh, online office hours, for example, uh, and especially if it's an online course. It's kind of like a video conferencing. You can have many of your students there. I'm holding office hours from three to four where I will be on Zoom, right? It's a face-to-face -face thing where you, uh, there's chatting, uh, you can silence people, you can raise hands, and I've got a question. Uh, other people can watch you answering those questions. Uh, so you can use it for online office hours as well. And of course, uh, Zoom also will record, uh, and you can download it later, edit it, uh, and, and put it up on YouTube if you want. So just some miscellaneous tips. Again, you need to get good webcam covers. So you, see, you can see right here, you won't see it uh, live, but I've got just a, uh, something, a, a physical barrier that I can slide over and then slide, uh, uh, slide back. Uh, you never know when, oops, I forgot my webcam is on or something like that. Uh, but if you have a physical barrier, and also, you know, uh, I'm in technology enough that I know that anybody can hack these things. Uh, and so the only, but nobody can hack uh, a piece of plastic covering everything, right? Uh, so get good webcam covers just for your own uh, assur assurance that you know if you're, if you're not being recorded in your own home or anything like that. Or, oops, I accidentally left OBS running. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just go ahead and, 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 and shut the cover and, and be okay with it, right? Keep your videos short and sweet. Again, you need their digest versions. Uh, absolutely need a good mic setup. Uh, I can't tell you how many videos I want to go back and re-record just for the simple fact that the, uh, it sounds like I'm talking into a cam on that $20 headset microphone. Um, don't underestimate the time commitment, uh, especially if you're doing pre-prepared videos. There's really no time commitment whatsoever with uh, uh, VidGrid other than you know maybe chopping off the beginning and chopping off the end. When students come rushing up to ask you questions, I do cut that off. Uh, or in the beginning, uh, if, there, if there's some student up there, okay, we need to start lecture now, go please sit down, we are recording, right? Um, it, it also, it's a little weird dynamic because uh, you're, you know, if you're in a TV studio and they go five, four, go, that's kind of how you feel when you're, when you're using the VidGrid system, that you're sitting there waiting for the exact time, okay, now let's start, right? And people are staring at you for two minutes of silence, and, uh, but, uh, but uh, that, uh, that's necessary when you're recording it. Right? So questions, comments, or if you've got uh, other tools, uh, the only way that I learned about OBS was through uh, the, the Century Club last year. Somebody said, oh, we've got the One Button Studio. I'm like, what? And I'd never heard of that before until somebody just mentioned it in passing in the Century Club. And I went to it, and I, I, I love it. Uh, there, again, it's a long way to go, but uh, I've definitely used it and will continue using it. So uh, any, uh, any uh, other stories or any technologies that people have used? Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, what size of USB memory do you recommend? Uh, 64 gigs is only 20 bucks. Uh, that's big enough. Yeah, that's, big, that's pretty much big enough, yeah. Uh, each each video, if you go 20 minutes, maybe a gig, uh, uh, so you can fit a lot on there. Um, it has to be a USB stick. I have a external hard drive. I tried plugging that in; it did not recognize it. Uh, so a USB stick, uh, 32 gigs would be fine. Uh, if you're, it depends on how much you want to retain on there. And of course, it's not going to be permanently on there. You just use it to transfer. Uh, so. Uh, uh, you probably don't want to go too too large because then you get into uh, whether or not it recognizes like 256 or 
512, you can buy those, but a lot of USBs uh, don't, uh, don't recognize things that large. Yeah. Uh, no, I've just done it because I, uh, I, I wanted to do it. <laughs> and I mean, I, I, there's, so there's been support for my, excellent support for my department. Because I say, I want to make some videos. Will you pay for a month of summer salary? And I'm going to make th this stuff. And they say, yes. They've never said no to me. Uh, maybe, that, maybe I'm in, in a fortunate department that's flush with cash. I don't know. But uh, there, 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 there's always a uh, yes, do this, yes, video, yes, online. Uh, and we'll worry about the money later on. <laughs> uh, but as far as ITS support, I've never gone to them, so I don't know. But maybe, Ryan, go ahead. Instructional designers. In the College of Engineering, that would be Tariq, or not anymore, maybe. Oh, who? It was Tariq. Well, easy, easy, yeah. Okay. Right. UNL's instructional designers, they would be able to at least point you in the right direction. Uh, with One Button Studio, I've always just uh, emailed Brad, something's broken, you need to come down here. <laughs> uh, Brad Severa, uh, his, the ITS group is in charge of most of that technology. Um, I know that there is a group of people that have like these big uh, cabinets of video equipment uh, and they go and film things but at a cost. Uh, VidGrid of course would be by ITS. Um, uh, but as far as like, a, uh, I've never seen like a Camtasia training uh, session or anything like that or best practices. I don't know. This is that's why I kind of volunteered to do this because I haven't seen anything like it. So uh, get the conversation started. Maybe they, maybe somebody could do a better job than I just did. Of all the ways that you use to draw things in the video and the video discretion towards the whiteboard or the overhead displays, drawing on the computer. Uh, I, I haven't drawn on the, the computer. I've, I've drawn on the uh, overhead uh, projector, and I like that uh, because just because if it's if it's math oriented, it depends on the content. If it's math oriented, I like free handing stuff, uh, and so I, I do like that overhead projector. Uh, if I'm especially if I'm writing mathematical symbols and stuff like that, uh, I can go back and forth on the pages. Not only that, but I take the notes and then I scan them and then I post the notes. So that's an added benefit there. Uh, you can't scan a whiteboard. Uh, but if it's coding, then I, uh, I prefer the computer because then I'm actually writing code. I can mark up the code. Uh, and then I post that as well. So uh, it, it all depends on what you're doing. Uh, one, uh, math, uh, more writing. The whiteboard is excellent. Uh, if, if you've got a well-prepared lecture uh, and you know exactly what you're going to be doing and um, uh, and, and you have a good hand. I don't have a great hand. <laughs> so I, I'd like a piece of technology that could improve my handwriting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ice spring? Okay. Ow. Okay. All right. So uh, better than Adobe Presenter, but but a uh, high price tag there. And then you could uh, get the department or university wide uh, license, maybe that'd be cheaper. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. Okay. Any other questions or comments?
keep the Century Club alive then. All right. Uh, okay.